How do we attract buyers, not just seekers and lurkers and inquirers and people who are just watching? It's easy to get likes and follows. When I think about my first 100K cash month, that happened with an audience of less than 2,000, 3,000 people. You don't need massive audiences. You need the right people. When you look at two people who go live on Instagram, one blows up, one you're starring, one you're like, oh my gosh, who is this woman? And the other one you're like, scroll past. What's the difference? The only difference is how they show up. And how they show up changes what they say and how they say it. What does that even mean? It's the energetics of how you say it. Less is so much more in business. It's doing less, but being more intentional with the doing that you're doing. It's doing less, but being on when you're on. It's thinking really clearly of who do I actually want to speak with and work with and all of that. And then going on an Instagram live and speaking so directly to her. So this is the piece around trust is, am I actually playing on the field or have I been sitting out this whole time thinking I'm playing on the field? Hey there, everybody. It's Erica here. I am so excited to introduce you to my friend and mentor, Mary Morgan. I've been working with Mary for a little over just about a year now. So I'm especially excited to bring her in as a guest speaker and to have her share all of her knowledge and goodness with you guys. And so I'll let Larissa say a little bit more about Mary. Just wanted to let you know she is so amazing and I'm so glad to have her here. Hi everyone, welcome back to another one of our magnificent masterclasses. It's Larissa from Team EPN Co. And today's class is going to be magical because we are joined by the lovely Mary Morgan, who is an expert at magnetizing high-end clients with ease. We are joined by the lovely Mary Morgan, an online business and social media mentor. Mary has learned a lot building her business from $100 to her name in 2018 to 80K, 100K, 130K cash months over and over again. She started her business by getting on over 165 sales calls before closing a single client. She created a new wave of marketing with a focus on experiential and identity marketing. She works with entrepreneurs all around the globe on things like femme communication, magnetic sailing, experiential marketing, and building a world-renowned brand. We are so excited to have her join us here today to share her expertise in accessing our abundance. Let's give a warm welcome to the iconic Mary Morgan. Can I just be introduced all the time by Larissa? That was just world class. So thank you so much, Erica, the team, Larissa, of course, for having me on. I'm so excited to have this conversation. And this is going to be a big conversation. I know a majority of you are service providers and you're in that space or you're a coach or you're a consultant or you're a e-commerce brand. Like no matter what stage or kind of business that you own, magnetizing dream clients is all that we want as business owners, right? One of the first and foundational things that people ask me when they enroll and they want to work together is like, how do I attract more clients with ease? That is the magical question. How do I have tons of people flooding towards me and it just feels easy and it just feels light and it just feels effortless. And it's like everyone looks for this secret sauce. What is it? Is it Facebook ads? Is it running a specific kind of campaign on social media? Is it collaborations? Is it like, what is the thing? I've seen so many people who come through with this question, how do we attract buyers, not just seekers and lurkers and inquirers and people who are just watching? It's easy to get likes and follows. When I think about my first 100K cash month, that happened with an audience of less than 2,000, 3,000 people. You don't need massive audiences. You need the right people. Step number one is brick versus ball. So the very first piece here is we are all bricks. We are all balls. A brick is someone who you give them a little flick and they're just not moving. Give them another little flick. They're just not moving. You're like, this thing is for you and they just don't move. A ball, you make a little post, it activates them, they're moving. This is what I want. This is the service I need. This is how much I'm going to pay for it. Boom, boom, done. 
So that's really the difference between the two. When we think about both entities, a brick who you flick and they just don't move and a ball who you barely need to tap and they just start rolling. The difference is how we speak to them because we're both at times bricks and we're both at times balls. I had a client who was in the anxiety space and as she was speaking to her people, she's like, do you ever feel you're just stuck? Like you're tired. You don't feel like doing this. And of course, who's that speaking to? That's speaking to a brick. They're holding on to this title in this area of I'm stuck. I'm struggling. You're trying to find the right people. No one does a good job. You've been trying with this person and then this person and this person. Guess what? They're going to come and work with you. And they're a nightmare client because they think you also suck like the other hundred people that they wanted to work with. So in our messaging, we want to speak to the one who's already moving the ball. So the first piece here is who we attract is the lighthouse that we put out. So it's like when you think about a lighthouse, it's calling in all the boats. So if you have a red or orange lighthouse that's calling in all the red, orange bricks, then the bricks are all coming to this lighthouse. Amazing. Nightmare clients is horrible. Oh my gosh, what do I do? My profit margins are low. I'm stuck. I'm struggling. Like, how does that all happen? It starts in the front end, doesn't it? And then on the flip side, you have the balls where you put the lighthouse out. Here are the people who are moving. This is what's happening. Boom, they're coming into the, your world. They're getting amazing results. They're doing this. They want an upgrade with this. They're just moving and they're doing their thing. When we speak to a ball, they're self-led. So the way that they buy is different. They just move, right? They take action. They see the thing that they want and they just buy it. They don't need someone to convince them. Whereas for a brick, it's like you're convincing, you're trying, you're doing your thing. And of course, if you do that on the front end, you're going to have to do that on the back end. So this is key number one, brick versus ball. How I want you to think about this is the sign you put outside of your storefront. We are open for balls or for bricks. What is the sign? What are you saying? Because that's the front end of everything in your business. So how do we actually do that? Number two is what I call priming or conditioning your audience. So when people aren't buying, it's because there's high friction and low perceived value. Let's take a graphic designer as an example. If someone isn't buying, it might be like, I'm doing my own graphics, or I've had people who have hired and it's felt a little clunky. It hasn't been my style. These are all pieces of friction. These are all things that are like, I'm not going to do this because this. I was selling a program called Iconic. This whole program is about content and brand. But what most people think leads to sales and revenue is their offer is how they're selling, is sales calls, like is all these pieces. So I'm talking about how amazing this is, but I'm not tying it to how they're going to get this result with it. Let's say you're someone who does done for you social media, but someone doesn't see how important social media is for their brand, then of course they're not going to buy this thing. Someone who's doing their own social media might see that as a piece of friction. How are you going to get my voice? How are you going to get my tonality? How are you going to get the, the style that I, I desire? Oh, it's easier. I'll just do it myself. Do you see how actually working with you is higher friction than me doing it by myself? So these are all pieces of who is the most ideal person and what are all the pieces of friction that they might have? I was hosting a mastermind with one of my good friends, Michael Edwards, who I think was in this space as well, which is super exciting. When we were promoting this, one piece of friction is literally, for my audience, who the hell is Michael Edwards? And for his audience, who the hell is Mary Morgan? Like, that's a piece of friction because I'm investing in this, but I don't know who this is. So what this looks like on social media and through your content and, and through how you show up is actually knowing who is my most dream client? What do they look like? And what are the pieces of friction that actually hold them back? So if I was a social media manager and I knew my dream client is like, she's got ideas coming left and center and she just can't keep up with them. So I would create a post that you're a visionary, you're a leader, you're building something massive in the world and you've got ideas that are coming all over the place. That's where I come in and I take charge of your social media. I get so clear on your brand. I listen to your trainings. I go in your videos. I get clear on your voice. I get clear on your messaging. And then you're talking about how this would actually work together. There's other pieces like if I hire someone, would it take more time for them to understand my brand values? Maybe it's saying things like, and this all happens in a span of a week. 
and we come in and you don't have to train me on anything. I actually just go and consume all your stuff and then produce pieces of content and show you and see if that's in alignment. That could be part of your process, but it's putting that forward and it's priming your audience of these are the things that are actually happening behind the scenes. And, and this whole process reduces the friction and increases value. Okay. So number one, brick versus ball. Number two, reduce friction, increase value. The next piece is an offer suite. When so many of us focus so much on new business, one of the biggest things I hear from most people is like, how do I bring in new sales? 80 to 90% of your revenue really should come in from your back end model. It's building brand loyalty. It's building sustainability. This is the lifeblood of your business. So this is where it's like, can I withstand an entire year of no quote unquote new revenue coming in, but my recurring revenue can pay team? can do this. I know Erica talks quite a bit about profitability in your service business and how to charge high ticket. So this is a really important piece where it's based on pricing. There's that to consider, but there's also this back end of what are people doing and how are they moving from thing to thing? This is how you take a $1,200 sale to a $40,000 sale to a $120,000 sale. It's Allowing people to move from thing to thing. I was just talking to my husband about this yesterday. He's a big gamer. So he, he was telling me about the Xbox. And he's like, when you think about the Xbox, they actually lose money on the front end. The cost of making the console, they lose money. But on the back end, they make so much money. So I'm not saying here lose money on the front end. But what I am saying is when you actually focus on the back end, you 10x your business so much faster because you're not just focused on new things that are coming in here. And it's not sustainable if you're just focused on new, because then you're on this like cat and mouse chase hamster wheel. So the next piece that I want you to think about is like, how do I actually build in an offer suite where someone can go from thing to thing? So let's say you create funnels for people. You're a service provider that does funnel build building, websites, et cetera. You might consider that instead of having one package that includes 45 different elements of a funnel, you might have, this is a sales funnel package. This is just on growth website stuff. And then you have another offer that this is for lead generation. That's this kind of offer. Then I have another piece that's on your homepage and brand awareness. So now I have three different website offers that are all part of a package that are building an ecosystem. So someone will come in, and this is part of the client journey, someone will come in and they're like, yes, I love this piece around, I need new leads to come in, so I'm gonna purchase this. Leads are coming in and now they need a sales funnel. Now you create a sales funnel. Sales are coming in, now I need a portal created or a backend created. So it's like, instead of just one all in thing, which can be an option, but it's having these little pieces where someone can buy a $5,000 this sort of site, then a $10,000 pack of this, and they can continue to upgrade. And you might have something then that's a retainer model. So now people are like, oh, I'm going from thing to thing. Why not just get into a retainer and you're building your recurring revenue? So this is like a huge thing that I would start and re-listen back to, especially if you're noticing that you're constantly on a hamster wheel chase of new sales. The fourth key is leaning in and leaning back. When to lean in, when to lean back. So there are moments in your business, just like we talked about priming, understanding brick versus ball, brand loyalty, sustainability, building this lifeblood of your business. Like these are things where we lean in and we're building structures, we're building systems, we're building our offer suite, we're cleaning out the back end, we're making sure things are all set up. So of course there's that where we're leaning in, but there's also bits where you want to lean back. And I find especially service providers, especially coaches, especially consultants, like in all of these industries, one of the hardest things is leaning back (laughs) because they're like, but that's not productive if I lean back. But then this needs to get done. How could I possibly lean back? When I say lean back, it doesn't mean do nothing. So there's leaning in where it's building structures. And then there's the unsexy work, the behind the scenes work that's personal power, that's holding duality, that's navigating hard conversations with clients, hard conversations with team. There's all that stuff that comes into the mix that then significantly shifts the entire dynamic of how you lean in. So if you're leaning in, but you just had this hard conversation with a client 
And then you're like, shit, I got to do this masterclass. You go and do the masterclass and you're like, that was a hot mess. Like that's what creates that really weird dynamic in your business, but also in your life. So there's this piece that I look at where there is a difference between trusting the verb of trusting and the noun of trust. I see trust as it's just who I am. Just like I have dark brown hair. It's just it. Like it's a noun. It's not a thing that I need to do. It just exists. Versus trusting is a thing that you put on. It's a thing that you do just like running. It's a behavior. So there is a very distinct difference between the behavior of trusting and the being of trust. How many times have you said to any one of your mentors or coaches something like, oh, I'm doing this, but it isn't working. I'm doing this and it hasn't quite clicked yet. I've been trying this and I've been trying that and that didn't work. And you're like, I'm doing all the things, but why isn't something just clicking? The way that I think about that is imagine if you went to a marriage counselor and she said to you, okay, you're going to speak to your husband and you're going to say this. You're like, okay, got it. So you go and you're like, so I spoke to Sarah she told me to tell you that should not be happening. <laughs> and he's like, how much are you paying her to tell you to tell me this? <laughs> what? And then you're like, Sarah, I told him, didn't work. He just laughed at me and said, how much am I paying you? So clearly this marriage isn't working. So she's like, well, tell me, how did you say it? And you're like, well, I just said it how you said it. She's like, okay, this is what I want you to do. So you go back and you're like, I know this isn't going to work. Anyways, okay. And it's like, but that doesn't work. So when people do the thing, I'm like, cross it off. If that's how you're showing up, that doesn't work. You go and you send an email and you're like, oh, but oh, I've been sending emails. Fine. Erica told me to do it. Mary told me to. I'm going to send it. So you send it. And you're like, see, Erica, see, Mary, it didn't work. Of course it didn't work. How did you say it? Energetics are so important in our business. Strategy and tactics are huge, but the energetics are, I would say, far more important. It's like the 80 20, even 10 percent tactics, strategy, everything else, energetics. Why? When you look at two people who go live on Instagram, one blows up, one you're starring, one you're like, oh my gosh, who is this woman? And the other one you're like, scroll past. What's the difference? They both used Instagram. They both pressed live. They both did their hair that day. They both got dressed. What's the difference? The only difference is how they show up. And how they show up changes what they say and how they say it. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. What does that even mean? It's the energetics of how you say it. It's not just you're using the same words and you're shifting how you say it. It's the energetics that you say it in. So this is what I mean by lean back. It's not necessarily doing more all the time. In fact, less is so much more in business. It's doing less, but being more intentional with the doing that you're doing. It's doing less, but being on when you're on. It's thinking really clearly of who do I actually want to speak with and work with and all of that. And then going on an Instagram live and speaking so directly to her as if you were on a FaceTime and she was on the other line. So this is the piece around trust is, am I actually playing on the field or have I been sitting out this whole time thinking I'm playing on the field? The people who tell me I've been in business for 10, 20, 30 years and this isn't clicking, this isn't clicking. Like, how is that possible? And then when I actually see them, I'm like, your energy isn't in it. You're not even on the field. You're not on the court. You're sitting on the benches. And you're like talking about people who are on the court. Leaders in this industry are not afraid to F up, to embarrass themselves, to make the wrong moves, are not afraid to have those hard conversations. All of these things are hard. That's why we call it the 1%. The 1% in business, the 1% in services, the 1% in every industry isn't easy. It's they're willing to F up publicly. They're willing to do an Instagram live, but put their heart out there and actually be on the field, not be on the field, but like heart is like over here and I'm showing up, but then you're not showing up. You're showing up how you want to be seen, which isn't showing up. Anytime you do that, what happens and why I say you're not on the field is you've got a smoky mirror in front of you. So anytime you're there, but you're not there, you're not there at all. How many times have you had a conversation with someone and you're like, okay, I don't know if they're listening, but like something isn't clicking. Like, 
<laughs> is she is she there? Is she thinking about her weekend? You can just feel like the person's not fully present with you. So when we feel that, it's like we're not even having a conversation. It's the same in business. We're not even doing anything at that point. And then finally, there are three specific stages in business. So I want you to notice what stage you're in right now. There's the stage of growth, which is obviously an incline. Things are happening, coming in, things are moving, things are grooving, so many things are happening. So there's the growth phase. There is sustainability, where people call a plateau. So it's like we haven't really grown, but we're sustaining. Usually sustaining happens for a reason. It's because you want to sustain, consciously or unconsciously integrated. And then there's a recalibration period where people call a dip. I don't call it a dip, but recalibration. What a recalibration period is like, whew, sales came down or something came down. And usually there's that thing where there's like a little, well, let's come back down here so that we can recalibrate and go back to sustaining. It's usually a sign of like, oh, something is off. Let's look at something here. But what most people do is they get emotional about these different stages. They're like, oh my gosh, we're growing. Amazing. Oh no, there's a dip. Oh, what do we do? If you think about the stock market, stock market goes up and down on its way up. It doesn't go up, 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 up. It goes up and down on its way up. So there are periods of growth, sustainability, recalibration. These are the different stages. You want to just notice what stage that you're in. If you're like, oh, I'm in a growth phase, you're going to notice everything that comes up comes down. Everything that's down comes up at the end of the day. So you'll be at a stage where you're on a high and it's ride the wave, amazing, and it'll come down and it'll come up. So it's like actually honor the cycle of the wave, get excited about the different phases that come through. I find that every single level of these stages is so fun because there's lessons, there's learnings, there's anchorings, and it always continues to go up in the long run. So it's like, it doesn't even matter. But as you look at these stages, it gives you something to anchor into. Oh, I love that so much. Thank you. So the first question that I would love to ask you is, you talked a little bit about back end sales. And I definitely see how that works for some of our members that are in like B2B services have retainer models. What about someone like an event professional or someone who has a singular focus of selling services for an event, maybe like a wedding planner, or someone in the events industry? Totally. I was just going to give the example of a wedding planner. Perfect. <laughs> and Mary just got married. So she's in the world. She gets it. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the world. I hired my planner. It was amazing. But this is a great example. It's like, when would I reach back out to her? If she offered other events, I think that would be amazing. I would totally rehire her for other events that she would do if she would offer that service. But there's some planners in general that are like, nope, I'm just wedding. So it could be products where it's like aftercare products, wedding has passed, and you can form collaborations and relationships with other vendors. And you can create product lists or like care package, like wedding care package, honeymoon care package, like things like that, or keeping the love and the romance alive after the wedding. And there's like a subscription box that they get. I would so love to receive something once a month. And I would easily pay for that from my planner who designed my wedding, who knows me, who knows my style. And it could literally be like trinkets of the wedding day. And maybe it's once a year on your anniversary, you get a little box like that could be something. That's what I would personally do. But again, there's some people who are like, that's a whole business model in and of itself. I think that's important to note because if we're always focused on that one core service and then we don't have the opportunity to have a back-end offer or an upsell or an upgrade, thinking about event planners, they could also talk about maybe having travel services and look at honeymoon planning, or maybe they could expand into baby showers. I think that's about building the market. If your market doesn't understand what's out there, what's possible, sometimes you have to bring those opportunities there. A lot of people in the service business industry, it's very different from coaching. In coaching, it's so natural to have these mini front door offers or like a downloadable or a freebie. Do you have any tips for people that aren't in the coaching world? For How can we break the mold for the industry and just do something that nobody else mm -hmm. is really doing? 
Totally. And I had an agency before this business model as well. So I was in the service space as well. And one of the things that I loved doing was like playing with shorter term things, as well as things that could be streamlined, evergreen, et cetera. Like I would ask yourself, what would be so supportive to my market, but also where and how can I innovate in this industry? This is truly where you then invent your own category. This is where you're not in discernment when I say this, you're not just another graphic designer, you're you. Like you have your own category. If you're a social media person, as an example, you could offer social media audits. You could have a PDF that's like how to audit your own social media. As a graphic designer, photographer, you could do the same thing. How to take better iPhone photos and you could do a little course or a little training or a little PDF because there's that segment of your market that you're not capitalizing on. There's the segment that's like, just take my own photos. But there's also a segment that's like, you could charge 200, 300 bucks for people to get a PDF and a little video of like how to take really solid photos on your iPhone and take videos that you could use for social media. There are so many different areas in your niche that most people don't capitalize on it. So someone could pay 200 bucks and do it themselves, or they could pay me a thousand, two thousand dollars and I'll do it. It could be a website. Here are the common pitfalls in your website that you're missing for high converting sites. And it could be a little PDF. It could be like a little do-it-yourself kit that they could figure out. And it doesn't need to take that much time. Like your team could put this together. You could record a quick little video. Like these are small little things that you could do that don't take a lot of time, but are so streamlined. And then in those PDFs, you can have an upsell. So you can say, want me to do this with you? Whatever you paid for this product, let's say it was $200, we'll apply it as a credit and we'll do it for you. Like how sexy is that of an offer? Like it's not, okay, buy an additional thing. It's use what you just paid on this audit and I'll just do it for you. I love that. Looking at our members and our community and the people in our world is that I want people to stop focusing on that one sale because I think we're missing a lot of opportunities. We're missing people coming in the front door and we're also missing a lot of upsells. And I've worked on this with Mary and I do this with our clients. You really have to think about what is my client journey from start to finish? Where are they before they know they need me? What are they thinking about then? Or once they have me, what else do they need? Mary, would you mind sharing a little bit about Apple, how you think about Apple and how they bring people into totally. the world? Hold on a second. <laughs> Hold on a second. Right. <laughs> Seriously, if they had an Apple subscription that was like 500 bucks a month, I would pay for it and get products sent to me. I totally would do that. So when we think about Apple, you go in and you buy one product. But then over the course of a year, you've bought 5, 10, 20 products or over the course of 10 years or whatever it is. You go from spending $150 to spending $10,000 on a MacBook, on this product, on that product, and all these different pieces. I'll give you a great example. So we opened up a product called Black Card Access, which is a retainer model of all programs, all courses, all things for 12 months. This is comparable if you're in the service space. And I did this when I was in services where they would get like one kind of graphic a month, one kind of that a month for 12 months. They're committed to 12 months and now they're paying on a retainer for those 12 months. So whatever industry you're in, it's comparable in all these different spaces. And what I love is one woman, she was there when we pitched Black Card Access, but didn't buy in that space. I talked about one specific offer today that was $4.99 and she was like, oh, I want this. This was such a no brainer. So she went into that. But then at the end of that program, I'm going to say, If you want to use what you've paid as credit towards black card, you can, and some of those people will then upgrade. So these are ways where you keep people consistently in your ecosystem. So you might have a 12 month retainer and then people are in all these different things, but there's ways to upgrade consistently or the flip side of it. They're doing one product at a time, but at the end of every email, every delivery you give them, there's a little PS that says, want to join our all access brand blah 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 membership where you get one graphic one this one this a month for x dollars email us back watch your sales start to skyrocket with people who are buying individual things and they're like why am i doing this i'll just get on a subscription subscription models are huge netflix is a subscription model and when we think about it it's a powerful model because people are consistently paying you month per month 
What does that build? It builds your recurring revenue. What is amazing, especially for you guys who are service providers mainly, is like you're not, again, on this hamster wheel of like, where is my next sale going to come from? Like, you don't ever want to be in that place. Then you're always in fear survival mode and you've got like your fear goggles on and there's a part of your brain that is your fear part of your brain. And then there's the other part of your brain that's the innovation part of your brain. You can't be in both spaces. So if you're playing in fear and you're like, but then this is happening, then you can't come up with cool offer ideas and offer suites and all the things, right? It's like these can't coexist at the exact same time. So what's really important is actually recognizing, ooh, I've been playing in survival. And when I'm in survival, I'm defending. But you can't be playing if you're defending. Mm. I love that. Think about say, event planner, out of all the things we talked about today, what could be a good takeaway for an event planner could be upsells and upgrades. It could be add on sales that might fit that model better. You can't always use a subscription, it doesn't always work. But maybe you'll figure out something like Mary was talking about innovation coming up with a box, or maybe you'll start teaching, or maybe you'll start coaching, or maybe any of these things. Maybe you decide to have a DIY coaching container for brides who want to DIY. Maybe you start a YouTube channel. So there's always these different potential revenue streams. So if you're a photographer, think about maybe shifting your client a little bit. Maybe you already have a wedding uh, side of your business. Maybe you've already tried like a personal or Um, editorial shoot or like family shoot or socials, but maybe you want to think about corporate a little bit and doing some B2B. How can I add something to what I'm already doing? And I do want to say with the caveat that you do want to make sure that your core service is working well and that you have all of your ducks in a row and you have your things working like a really Mm well-oiled machine. So if you're not to that point yet to add these pieces on, that's totally fine. Think outside the box a little bit. Think about upgrades, add-ons, subscriptions. Think about front door offers, maybe some freebies or an audit. These are all extra ways to make money with the current audience that you already have and the current clients you already have. In our Mm -hmm. world, a lot of service entrepreneurs hide behind their portfolio. And so they're posting their portfolio and their beautiful work, but they're not really showing up on camera for the person who might be hiding behind their portfolio. How do they start to go from sharing work to like speaking to balls on their social media and being out there? Yeah. And what I'll say is it works. Like you can share your portfolio and you'll get sales. Like I did that as well. And it's like, there's that piece. So you can post and you'll get sales and you'll post your other branding and you'll get sales. So it works, but it'll get you to like good in your business. Like you'll hit a cap where it's like, people are seeing me, this is happening, this is working. But there's an element of, I want to know the human behind the brand that I'm working with. So this is a high piece of friction. Just picture someone who's a contractor and you're seeing all their amazing housework and you're seeing how they're putting up moldings. That's amazing. But then you want to meet who the person is. You're going to call them and you're like, hello, is this a scam? Is this a real account? What is this? It's the same thing in any industry. Would you want to hire someone who you're just seeing their content. You might, but you're only capitalizing on a percentage of your audience who they'll wait to meet you on a call. They'll go through those different elements. But for someone like me, I make decisions quickly and I'll move quickly. So I just want to see who is this? How are we connecting? What does this work look like? So I feel like there's such a barrier that you're putting around yourself of being seen. You want more visibility like we talked about, but you're not being visible. A lot of people say, I want more people seeing me, but then I don't want them seeing me. And I feel like that is so true. And that's how Mary caught me. I'm definitely a ball. Like I'm the kind of person, you give me a little flick and I'm gone. But the way that Mary was talking in her messaging and the way she was talking to her audience, she was talking to me. She wasn't talking to someone who was going to invest in coaching and then not do anything. She's not talking to someone who's going to come and join a program and never watch the video. She was talking to a leader who knows that they have challenges, who also has tried things, but also is ready to try more. And I think that's really important for everyone to think about how can you adapt that for your audience. Larissa, I'll pass this off to you. Do you have anything you want to ask Mary? I know you do. (laughs) I always do. (laughs) 
this. That was actually perfect timing because I wanted to go more into the energetics. I loved your point, Mary, about leaning in versus leaning back. And you said that leaning back is the behind the scenes conversation with team and how this work shifts the dynamic of leaning in, which is coming on the live masterclasses, like front facing work. So I would love to go into more of holding the duality of that. How do you continue to hold your usual energy of showing up doing the leaning in work when there are times when maybe in life or in business where the leaning back work is chaotic behind the scenes? Yeah, totally. And this is such a good question. And I love that this is brought up because most people don't even ask this question. Usually, again, it comes back to the strategy. It comes back to the tactic. You could do that all day, every day. And I promise you it won't work if this stuff isn't changed because then the same patterns come up. You run the Facebook ads, but then the same patterns come up. You do this thing, but then the same patterns come up. And it keeps taking you down the same cycle to go fix this. <laughs> AKA me and how I show up because that is actually the thing that needs the work. So when I think about duality, it's, I remember in the beginning of my business, it would take a long freaking time to go from being just triggered by something to then showing up. It could have taken months or weeks for me to go from, I am triggered by this. I need space. I'm going to oh. take like a six month sabbatical <laughs> like to get my stuff sorted. So it was that. It was also being in the moment triggered and then responding and being reactive. Like how many of you have had a client and you're like, no, Sarah, that is not what I meant as per my last email. And that trigger in you is coming out. When Larissa asked, how do you do this? It really is power of choice. You have to constantly choose. Do I sit with this? Do I react? right now, there's a difference between react and respond, right? Like you're in the moment, you're reacting, something's coming up and that'll look very different to how you respond to it. So it's human to react, but what you do in your response is everything. So something just happened, it triggered you. How do you respond? Do you respond by reacting or do you respond by responding? So that's the difference that really has helped me hold duality is I control how I respond. My reaction, it comes up, here it is. Oh my gosh, let's say tech isn't working today and the power goes out and we're on this call and I'm like, okay, now you guys don't know where I am and I'm trying to contact you. There's that one person that's like, the day is ruined. You know what? Like, we're done. This is horrible. And I'll show up and my reaction is just off and you just feel it. And it's repelling, right? When we talk about magnetism, magnets attract and repel. One of the biggest pieces around this is like, when we show up like that, we're obviously repelling those leaders. Because we're not a solid leader, we're not a safe investment. When we're truly a solid leader, we're a safe investment for other leaders. And how do we do that? We understand the difference between responding and reacting. So earlier on in the conversation, Mary said it doesn't have to take a long time. So when you're talking to the right person, it doesn't have to take a long time. So when I first saw Mary's posts on Instagram, it really triggered me. And I'm like, but wait a minute, what's this post? And then I went into the next post. Within reading three of Mary's posts, I already was in the link of her description on her Instagram buying an offer for $1,500. And within one month, I was upgrading to her mastermind, which is one of her higher end offerings. It's like some of you actually aren't talking to anyone <laughs> because if we're just sharing our work and isn't this pretty and isn't this great and we're just like posting for likes, essentially, we're not actually talking to the person behind the screen on the other side. We're just inspiring. We're sharing. We're showing. But we're not having a conversation. We're not standing out as a leader. We're not talking about the challenges that they're having right now. We're not talking about the end result of what they could have. So we're not actually talking. We're just sharing. So I think that's just a shift that we have to make. And we're not sharing any of these things to call anyone out. We're just wanting more, right? We just want more. What I want you to think about is what if tomorrow you shifted who you were talking to on your social media? It doesn't have to take long. Yes, yeah. it doesn't have to take long, but in the same breath, it can take long. It can. What we want to really preface with this is it doesn't need to take long when I say that. It's actually simple, but is it actually easy? It can be when you get used to it, but it takes time. It takes time to 
actually know how to articulate these things. It takes time to actually understand, am I priming people? Oh, am I just giving value? Like all this stuff takes time and it's building. So if you're doing this and you're like, yes, I'm doing this and it's not working, then you're not even playing on the field. Part of it is actually going, ooh, okay, I'm seeing this. Ooh, I'm seeing this. It's actually speaking. And I love what you said. It was speaking so direct to you versus just here are images of websites. People all the time who are creating content, but the content style that they're creating, let's say they want tons of eyeballs, but they're not going viral. Like I would create a video that if that's my person, I would go and be like, this is why your videos aren't actually going viral. It's not just the music choice. It's not just the captions. It's not just the hashtags that you're putting on your video. My team and I sit together and we actually strategically look through thousands of videos every single month. We then analyze what are the things that are actually triggering this month, the Instagram to push you and go viral. For my clients, what they value is they actually want to be pushed out to the algorithm and go viral. Their products and services might range between this range and this range. So the more people who are seeing their stuff, the more people are actually buying. That's a fantastic example of like, I'm not just saying our social media packages, that's a link in bio. And it's just images of me doing social media. I've seen that millions of times. Looking back at me working with Mary, when I say it doesn't have to take a long time, it doesn't. What does take a long time though, is the inner work, the confidence building, the seeing ourselves for who we are, the understanding the difference between us and someone else, the stepping into our power, all of these things, that's the inner work piece. That does take a lot of time. When I said it doesn't take a long time, I meant specifically when you do these strategies correctly and you start speaking to that right person, it doesn't take them a long time to go from looking at your brand on social media to then going to do something else, whether it's looking at another yeah. post or jumping up into the link in description. There are people in all industries who buy like this. There is the woman who walks into Gucci, she picks up the jacket, spends thousands of dollars and walks out. There's the woman who's looked in there, who's gone in and out, who continues to do it and will buy eventually. But we shop like that. Like some people will walk in 10 times and then move. Some people will see three reels and then move. Some people will see one reel and move. Some people will see 20. It doesn't even matter. Everyone's buying journey is different. So what we want to look at is the better we can make speaking to your balls, speaking so direct to our people, having a really solid ecosystems in our sales model. So like the back end process and the front end, when we've got this set up and we're just showing up over and over, it just works. It just works like going to the gym and one day that you've got abs. It's because you've been doing the reps every single day for a series of months and weeks and years. Of course, it feels like they just showed up yesterday, but it's been taking months or years, let's say, to actually integrate them. We could sit down and in 30 minutes, you know your strategy and you're good. It's easy. But it's like when we do the inner work, what tends to happen is each time something lands in the inner work, it's like the strategy also and the tactics just landed 10 times deeper. Yeah. It's way I'm seeing myself in my power. Ooh, I'm seeing my people in their power also. I don't need to walk you through 10,000 hoops just like I don't need to do that. And then when you show up, it's like each layer gets integrated. That's what we mean by also on the flip side, like it just gets to be easy. It's because it's so in you at this point, like it's in your body, it's who you are. So the more you actually show up, the more you go live, the first couple times you do it, obviously it's going to be uncomfortable, but then actually implementing, actually taking action on the stuff that we said today. If you literally took one thing from everything that we talked about today and you're like, Ooh, speak to balls versus bricks. And you just took that that could change your business. That is 100% true. If you can take away one thing, just start talking to balls and see what happens. Come on in, Larissa. <laughs> I love this because to the inner work piece that both of you touched on, I think this actually relates to what Mary said earlier about how trust is who I am. It's a noun. And trusting is the thing you do. It's the behavior. What is your advice for entrepreneurs who may feel self-doubt or fear, or maybe they're just beginning to shift into the person they want to become and how can they learn to trust themselves more so that the trust confidently becomes a part of who they are? Totally. I think in the beginning of your business, you start with a sense of courage that's just wild. I see it all the time. People who are like, oh my gosh, yes, I'm going to invest this $20,000. I'm going to make my money back. It's going to be amazing. You're like, yes, this is going to work. And then you go and you do it. 
And then it's like somewhere down the line, reality hits and it's, ooh, now I have team that I have to pay for. My decisions become more critical. You're not moving in the same way as you did. In the beginning of your business, it was like, there was two options, invest or don't invest. There was a stage in your life and in your business where you actually were a complete embodiment of trust. And it was probably the day you started your business and you're like, I don't know what could happen, but I'm just here for it. It could work. It might not work, but I'm here for it. We started with that trust initially. We started with it so embodied. And then it became something that you wear and you put on and it became trusting because then it's like, I have to trust. I've got this. So somewhere down the line, what tends to happen is you look for evidence, you look for validation, you look for, am I safe? Because you tend to feel I'm not safe. Now I'm in this scary thing where eyeballs are on me or I'm starting to post in a different way or I have the team I have to pay for or I have this that I have to do. So it's like you get in this space where you tend to wobble and what happens is like, oh, I'm seeing that this isn't working. What does not working mean, right? It's like what we see that it's working or not. But if you plant a seed in soil and you water it and then before you know it, it's, whoop, the plant was there. But it's like, imagine every single time you didn't see it grow, you took it out, you planted a new seed. You're like, these seeds aren't working. You plant a new seed. This is what so many people do. They don't trust. So they go into this back and forth of like, why isn't this working? Why isn't this clicking? So if you're someone who you feel like I consciously have to keep deciding the difference truly between trusting and then transcending just into the state of trust is there is no second option. Some people in their businesses have some sort of a plan B. So it's going in and there is no plan B. This is working. Mm. And it's knowing everything that happens for me and is happening for a reason. So that's where I truly see trust. And it's making a conscious decision. Like even now I still second guess. People ask me all the time, how do you, you know, speak from this place of like, you're an icon. How do you do that? And it's like, how could I not? This is who I am. And it's doing it over and over until it truly is who you are. And it just becomes part of you. I love that. And I have something that just popped into my mind related to all of this. So Mary was talking about how when we're brand new entrepreneurs, a lot of times we have that like fearless mindset until reality sets in. But then once reality sets in, there's this weird phase that pops in for entrepreneurs where people believe the harder I work, the better things will be. And so they go into this hustle without strategy mode. Step number one is fearless with reckless abandon. Step number two is hustle without strategy. Then step number three is strategy without energy. And then step number four is strategy plus energy. And when you get to that place where you have strategy plus energy, it's almost like, well, how can I lose? You know what I think is so interesting? I think movies effed us all up because when you watch fairy tales, you watch Cinderella, they kiss each other. They get to the end of the movie. She meets the prince and then they live happily ever after. It ends right where it's supposed to technically begin. They're happily ever after. (laughs) When we think about all these different movies, it's like just when it's beginning, it's cut. You live happily ever after when you receive this secret thing. So I truly believe that this is something that we've been so indoctrinated to like, when we finally get to blah, 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 we're going to receive this thing. Yeah. But it's like, why do you build a business? <laughs> and then we retire, right? <laughs> and then we retire. Yeah. Like when I make a million dollars, then I'll retire. But when we think about this, what's so interesting is we put this thing on a pedestal and you get there. And I remember hitting my first million and thinking, no one came to my house. No one gave me an award. Nothing happened. It just is. So it's like, why are you actually in business? Is it for a thing or for a feeling? And for everyone, it's I want to feel free. I want to feel love. I want to feel bliss. I want to feel joy. But then can't you do that now? Like, why do you need to wait until to have that? And it's so interesting because it's like, but you do have freedom. You can work technically whenever you want, but you decide and you consciously choose, no, I'm going to overwork myself because I think I'm going to get that. But that's the never ending cycle and lie that just continues to cycle until you wake up and realize it's a lie. I love all of this so much. I think the other thing that I would love for you to touch on is just the level good and bad, the level one good, the level Mm -hmm. 72 good and bad, because more 
you do and the more successful you become the more challenging it also becomes at the same time how do we expect it how do we navigate it without combusting yeah so what eric is talking about with the different levels is a common analogy that i use in almost anything that i talk about duality you want level 72 good but you can't handle level 72 bad so what you do is you're like, I can handle level two bad. That's good. One refund request. Okay. One nasty comment here. I can handle that. But why am I getting level two good? You can only walk at one level at a time. You can't be in two rooms at the same time. So what we really want to anchor in is what you're able to handle in good is what you're a match for in bad and vice versa. So it's you want the multi-million dollar empire where things are easy, where clients are just coming in and sales are just happening and people are upgrading from offer to offer. But then when refund requests come in, you freak out. When two clients ended their commitment earlier, all sorts of things are being unleashed and you're like, no, this is too much for me. If it's too much, no worries. Let's go down on a level. We'll receive less. That's recalibration. Let's get used to what feels good. And then we can start growing again. But you're like, no, I don't like that. But that's the way of the world, right? It's like, you can receive this, you can handle this. It's like separating reaction and separating then how you then respond from that reaction. I remember having a mentor who told me, just disconnect your business from your life. And I was like, but firstly, I don't want to do that because I'm so connected. I love what I do. And I remember it just didn't sit well with me. I don't want to disconnect. And I truly believe that both can coexist. Bad and good can coexist. You can have bad news happen and you can have your highest cash month or you can have your lowest cash month, but then your brother and your sister are getting married and someone just had a kid and like all this amazing stuff is happening. So I don't think that you need to separate bad and good. I think that they can be in the same room and they can coexist together, but it's how I hold it, how I respond to it, how I'm in it. That's what changes the difference because the biggest shift that I see is it truly is the level of power that you can hold. The woman who works from 8 in in the morning to 8 p.m., that's one level of power. There's also a level of power of the woman who's got three children. She's got a dog running around. She's doing this in the morning. Then this is happening. That carries a different level of power. So what we want to look at is how can I increase my capacity of power? And that might mean you're holding more things, but it's not... I'm doing more just for the sake of doing more. There's a distinct line between I'm doing more and I can hold more. I can receive more from an energetic level versus strategically and tactically just holding more. I think too, if we can think about Mary's level of good and bad, if you're running a business at level 72, you're going to encounter some things that are challenging. But I also think just as a mindset flip, think of it also too as levels of success and safety because you Mm. can't have a high level of success and a high level of safety at the same time. Sometimes there's things that go along with that that are challenging. So I think part of expanding as an entrepreneur and part of growing your confidence is learning that you can handle these challenges when they come your way. A lot of people think safety is that the challenges don't come your way. That's not it. The challenges are going to come your way. The safety is in how you handle it. Totally. And I think there's a part of this too that's like we were talking about with the social media and not showing your face. That's a part of hiding of safety. And when I think about safety too, it's like staying in comfort. What is comfort, right? It's a certain level of income. It's a certain level of what I'm used to. And then following that, you're like, why hasn't my income grown? But you want to be safe. You want to be hiding. Of course, it's sustaining or it's even recalibrating because you don't want to be seen. So there's that, or it could be growing, but then it's going to plateau at a certain point. Mary always talks about the edge and she uses this in so many different ways, but how can I push myself to the edge of my safety zone to show up there? And then once I'm comfortable there, then how do I push myself to come to the next level of this comfort bubble? to where I'm being seen a little bit more, I'm sharing a little bit more, or maybe I'm being a little bit more polarizing than I was before. So it's not like you need to go from zero to 60 in two seconds. As you're getting more comfortable with being out there, you should grow your confidence as you go. Mary and I have both done a lot of inner work on this. And so we both are at like a different level of comfort because we've done the work. And if we didn't do the work, we wouldn't be at that level of comfort. So I think what I want to encourage people to do is you have the strategy. Now let's add the energy to it. And then that's where the fire happens. 
Totally. And as you were saying that, I'm like, there's stairs to the next level. It's not an elevator. So it's not like <laughs> you just pop on the elevator and you're just up woo, 72. <laughs> you're taking the stairs, but there are things that can escalate it significantly. God might give you escalators every now and then and be like, whoa, that felt really easy. And that went from here to here. And then it's calibrating to that level. It's going through those different steps and ranges. And you might go down a level and come up a level and then go down three levels and then come up 20 levels because that excelled you. It's not just up and up and up. Just like we said, it's like when you go up in the stock market, you go up and down on your way up. You don't just go up. And I think for those of you who are listening to this and you may be earlier on in the journey of starting to think about things like showing up or not just doing the basics or trusting yourself a little bit more or building your confidence, by no means are we saying just get yourself out there and go. What we're acknowledging is that there's work to be done in this area of energy, in this area of showing up, in this area of who we're talking to. But I totally believe that no matter where you guys are right now, that you're ready for your next edge. Yeah, 100%. I've even had moments where I'm like, why change? Things are working. Why get even more uncomfortable? Sales are happening. This is working. That's working. But it's like, you know, deep down that you want more because you have that seed that's been planted in you by God, the universe, whatever you believe in. It's like you have that seed of I see a massive vision for myself. So sometimes when you question and things are so comfy, cozy here, things are working, but it's like, It could work so much more like the floodgates get to open, but I have to be the one that opens the doors. I can't just sit back and go, all right, open the doors, everyone enter in. I have to go up and force them open and be like, I am here. And just like what Erica, you were saying, Erica's phenomenal at selling. She's amazing at client delivery. You guys know that. She blows it out of the water. Her and her team are incredible. Then there is that layer of marketing and getting myself out there and talking about my services and being seen and visibility. That brings up a whole slew of stuff that's going to come through (laughs) around visibility, around being seen as the one or around all of these things. So it's allowing it to unfold In every stage of business, all of these things will continue to come up. They don't just disappear. The self-work is a consistent choice. So if you take anything from this, it's we get to choose. It's the power of choice. It's the choice to go for more. It's the choice to show up louder. It's the choice to show up in all that you are. So it's being okay with that happening, not needing evidence, not needing validation, not needing to feel like you're liked. And then you'll show up in a certain way and that just mucks up the energy too. So it's like, actually, when you step in and you're so confident, not just in your services, like that's layer one is I'm confident in my services. I'm confident in how I deliver. I'm confident in that. But now it's time that I actually show people what it's all about. One thing that I wanted to say about Mary saying more is that Mary always says to me, but what if this is where we're at now, but we could be somewhere else tomorrow. What if today I'm getting these types of inquiries and tomorrow I could be getting balls? It's what if. So I think some of it is about shooting for more and some of it is about delighting in the what if. You're comfortable in a spot, but what if the spot expanded just a little bit? Or what if it expanded a lot? I love how this came up. Erica and I were in this conversation. She's like, things are good. Like I would be good if the year completed here. And I'm like, yeah, but what if like... When you just play in that realm, and sometimes it's triggering because our mind goes, yeah, but I don't need it. Yeah, but I don't need it. So it's using that to be like, yeah, but what if? Let's just play it. Let's just plant that seed of what if we had our highest cash month and I did nothing and I just sat in the Bahamas and sipped a margarita? What if we're going behind the scenes with our team and we're building and we're not showing up at all in the front end? But what if 20 people inquired and those 20 people bought? What if? So this is a really fun exercise that you all can play at. It doesn't matter what stage of business you're in. The thing about this is like, it actually doesn't matter if it happens or not. Like I play this game all the time with our team and my team will be like, what if this is a million dollar month? What if if it is? And if, if your mind can think of how it can happen, it's too small. If your mind is like, oh, but that's really just 10 of these clients, too small of a what if. It has to be something where it's literally like, Who knows how that could happen, but it could, because I want you all to think about how many times has a miracle happened in your business? You didn't even send an email out and someone just randomly inquired and bought. Someone randomly just found Erica on the internet and was like, ooh, okay. And then reaches out. How many times has that happened? So 
it's actually more probable than it isn't. But we just put it away because we don't want it because it's uncomfortable to even go there. Mm, I love all of this. And hopefully you guys enjoyed this too. We just want to thank you so much, Mary, for being here with us. We love chatting with you so much. And if you guys are watching, I just want to add, uh, please do tell us in the comments what your favorite takeaways were. What did you love the most? What was an aha moment? What was something that you maybe never thought about before? Because Mary and I love reading those comments. And I know Larissa does too. So thank you, Mary. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.